before you even go further, and people will ask you after this seminar, did you learn anything about IP or intellectual property? Then at least after today, hopefully, I'll bring it uh, to you. A brief history of inventions. Ever since the day that our forefathers made the wheel or started the fire, it's an invention. And if you go to any library, you can look at invention books, how to do the invention of this and invention of that. And there was hardly any protection all this while. But when was the first law that actually came into being to protect your invention? That was in Venice in the year uh, 1473. There is an act which says that if you have a mention, we give you a right over it of 10 years. So that was the first law actually uh, implemented, giving you a certain period of time to look after your invention. But previous to that, England had their yeah, so called uh, letters of patents. Then they give you a monopoly over your invention, but no period. So it started off with uh, John Camp and all the others in the 1300s. But then once of Venice said, I give you 10 years. Then France follows suit, England follows suit. So carry on, carry on until we have today a standard practice throughout the world of 20 years of protection. Similarly for copyright, you write a book, what is the number of years of protection? When did it all start? So it all started in the many, many years ago. Copyright Act was under the Ends Act in the 1600s in England, giving you the 50 years of protection. But if you talk about trademark, even longer. In the old, old days, even if you make a coin, you have to have a chop on it. So you, uh, let's say in Rome, you have a chop on it. Uh, in China, you have a chop on it, all the different dynasties. So all these are trademarks. And you uh, actually come into the first law that make it into legal. You recognize trademark was in the 1200s in England for bakers. So when I sell a piece of bread, on the bread, I have a chop on the side of the bread. That means people know that this comes from my bakery. So then we started to protect each other on trademark, giving you 10 years protection or whatever number of years. But all these are uh, just old laws, but people needed protection. Otherwise, if I invent something or have a trademark something, then everybody will just copy it. So what happened was, we have the laws to protect each other. But in reality, IP rights actually developed around the 20th century or end of the 19th century when people started to go into inventions seriously. So in the beginning of the 20th century, there were only about 100 of patents in America, uh, very, very simple ones. Uh, but by the uh, end of the 20th century, in New York itself, I mean in America itself, or the patent office, they are giving up 200 over 1,000 patents per uh, year. Uh, so, of course, you can see what grow. Why 200 to 200,000? And in the old days, only a few countries like England, uh, America have some patents. But now, the rest of the world have patents after patents. If you follow me, then uh, we will have a uh, go through it. Then, if we talk about advancement of the country, the GNP. Is there any core relationship between a country which is very inventive, innovative, and the GNP? You know, in China, we had many, many good inventions. We had paper, we had firework, we had compass, and all that. But we never really commercialized it. But the Westerners did. For example, talking about cannons, China had firepower, and uh, did we do anything about it? Not really. No. We just would throw some stones and then hit the wall. That's about it. For hundreds of years or thousands of years. But the Mongolians took some Chinese uh, engineers, go with them, and improve the cannons. And then they destroyed all the cities that they went into Europe and all that. But once they attacked Europe and the Mongolians left, the Europeans looked at the cannons and they designed better cannons from it. But then when you make it bigger and bigger, uh, it's very really difficult to handle because if you have a lot of fire powder inside there, it will crack. Then some people say, how do we improve the strength of the cannon? Then uh, some smart guy said, uh, there are some skill in uh, Germany. 
where the cannon is very strong. So they went to check, and then one Englishman, and then see, this is interesting. Check the iron, and they found that there's manganese mixed with the iron. So in England, he went back there, and then he told all the uh, foundries there, and said, I can make your iron very, very strong, uh, provided you give me a royalty. So they said, okay, why we do that? So what he did was, he just go and take some mixture of manganese, without telling the iron smith what they're doing, throw the manganese in there. What the manganese does is, it just coagulates with all the sulfur and all the other impurities and flow on top. So you skin it off, and the iron become purer. So it become purer, then it makes steel out of it. Then it would crack. So that's how the steel industry developed in England. And then from on, they have a big artery. But China never did anything. India never did anything. So the British, with their strong cannons, they become a force to reckon with. They started the British Empire. Very, very simple, but that is what we call influence. But England become very rich because of military might, uh, but other countries did not. When England was going through the uh, so-called Industrial Revolution, the Chinese, most of us are Chinese, so I speak Chinese, right? were still peasants. We were all still in the agricultural age. China men like us, my forefathers, were all coolies. And if those who were educated, they were already educated in the Confucius classics. So we were never really taught about innovation, invention, commercialization of invention. And uh, even until today, I laugh uh, about our eating habit. If you go to China today, everybody eat instant noodles. Okay? Instant noodles. But if you ask who invented the instant noodle, everybody will say you, tell you that. A Japanese guy in Osaka did it in 1958. But in reality, the Japanese guy copied from the Chinese Yi Min, Yi Fu Min, where in the old days, if you remember the story, people having birthday, they carry the noodles to a Chinese home there. But this family is a rich family. So it was everybody gave him noodles, not to do the noodles. So what he decided was too much noodle, it was spoiled, or deep fried it and then I will give it away to the people and will keep it. So it became very popular. So this Japanese went to China, eat this noodle, and this is very good. So we went back to Japan, created a change a system, cook all the noodles first, pack it individually, and they call it Japanese instant ramen noodle. And it became the biggest, biggest company. Uh, but I, I said, but this is how I mentioned, but the Chinese now are out of the the Japanese system of doing it. I have visited so many instant noodle actually because I'm involved in this line of uh, business. That's why if you are interested, I will give you another lecture on how to make instant noodle. <laughs> 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 uh, but basically, Japan went with the invention. China invented it, but we did nothing. You can still go out to our market and still can buy the e -mail, but it's not uh, commercialized. And uh, you are not going to make millions out of it. And it's not convenient, you need a backpack. Why? Innovation. But China is now catching up to those I showed you. So, you look at that. People are moving. Japanese are moving very fast. Koreans are moving very fast. Singapore are moving. So you can see the GMP all very, very much related to patents and inventions. So, once you have this sort of awareness, then everybody started to follow the bad method. Last time only 200 patents, but now become millions of patents. Uh, so that's where today we are talking about how this culture actually developed. And it will develop and it will be even bigger. Okay, now we talk about innovation. Who is the most innovation, innovative country in the world? If you look at the latest government ranking, I mean the, by the World Intellectual Property Organization, the first three countries are the three S, Switzerland, Sweden, and Singapore. Singapore is number three. Uh, Malaysia is down there somewhere in the list. Those are the ones I can give to you. Uh, above Qatar. Uh, but never mind. Uh, but we are above Indonesia. Uh, if there's any comfort to you. Uh, but you look at that. 
for the top 10 countries, uh, you are Finland, UK, Netherlands, Denmark, Hong Kong, Ireland, and the uh, United States. Then followed down Luxembourg, Canada, New Zealand, Norway, Germany. But Hong Kong is a uh, listed there. So in the top 10, we have Singapore and Hong Kong. Now you are wondering, how does Hong Kong come into the picture? Why is Hong Kong very innovative? I, I go to Hong Kong regularly. I just talk to this team, I have to go there. And every time I go there, I, I marvel how innovative the Hong Kong people are. Do you know that? Just to go into the MRT in Hong Kong, ART, eh? it's the cheapest in the world. How many of you in Hong Kong use the MRT? You've you never been to Hong Kong. <laughs> it's even better than Singapore, MRT. I just hop in any train station I can drop off in Shenzhen. Uh, and yet it's so cheap. But now you'll be wondering, why is it so cheap? What is the trick? Hong Kong is a country where everything is privatized. So if you go there, you go to the Ehati Chama, the MRT station, it's actually a commercial center. Over the station, you do not realize that it's a station. It's a shopping center. It's a housing estate. It's a commercial complex. It's an office block. And they are getting revenue from all these properties, which is sitting right on top of their underground station. And because of this, they can uh, use it in a way of course synergy, uh, subsidize all the management of the underground. And that's very, very good. Because people say that, wow, so cheap to use the underground, so I go in there. But why you go in there? No, oh, there's a shop here, a bike. Or there's some place that I like this and that. Or since the MRT is so convenient, I live on top there. There's so many apartments for sale and all that. So it becomes a ecosystem of its own. And extremely creative. As a Malaysian, I go to Hong Kong three times, eh? they will give me a, a special pass. I don't need to show my passport anymore. It's just a credit card. I just go to custom then click, I'm in. It's all connected into the internet. But Malaysia will never connect into that. People carry a credit card from China and Hong Kong. Not possible. I bring machines to China to do them more. China will strip it apart and all sorts of bureaucracy. But Hong Kong, free. You can bring anything in, you can bring anything out. And best of all, I form a company in Hong Kong, 100% Winsor Wong. I go to Singapore, 50% Winsor Wong plus my cousin in Singapore. Uh, you understand what I mean? From Malaysia, different. Uh. But Hong Kong is 100%. So free. I, I find Hong Kong is the most innovative. So if you ask me to rank, of course I rank Hong Kong before Singapore. But this is called creativity. But in Malaysia, our intent, sorry, uh, LRT not connected. <laughs> I think LRT, uh, you know, it's really a very sad. You know? I go to Shanghai, at any point in Shanghai, I just pay six London fee. I go to the airport, Shanghai airport. Six London fee is three ringgit, Malaysia ringgit. Here, I have to, well, I have to show my pass, get my 35 ringgit to take a train. It's very tough, you know? and I can't get anywhere. I have to go everywhere. But anyway, this is what's called innovation countries. You go to New Zealand. Uh, I was from New Zealand, just now I say. I'm very, very much in touch with the uh, uh, IP and all that. And they're very, very creative. And I try to market their product. And you'll be seeing their product. For example, uh, in uh, terms of uh, electrical items or induction for current product, they are really, very, very good. So anyway, we just go on 